Uh, thank you very much for, the, uh, for having me. Thanks for coming out. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, this free fermion uh, duality and recognizing free fermions using graphs. So let's see, does it? Hmm. I'll just do this for now. Uh, oh, I don't know if I can. Hmm. Uh, there we are. Okay, so <clears throat> in general, simulating many body spin problem, many body spin Hamiltonians is difficult. Uh, the uh, ooh, there we are. Okay, the the major major issue being that the Hilbert space dimension grows exponentially with the number of qubits, and so uh, it turns out it's just hard. And so um, so one of the things that is really important is finding exact solutions to many body spin models. When we can find a subclass of these many body spin models that are or Hamiltonians that are exactly solvable, these they stand as uh, either they increase our knowledge and phenomenologically we can look at a larger class of problems or we can use them as starting points for perturbation theory or mean field theory or a whole bunch of other ways, impurity models, sort of ways in which uh, they can help. Um, and a, a particular class of exactly, <laughs> sorry, exactly solvable spin models are when a spin model can be solved exactly by a, a mapping to free fermions. And the reason that, this, that the free fermion solutions enable you to solve the model exactly is because you reduce the complexity exponentially. Instead of having to solve a two to the power of n by two to the power of n matrix, instead of diagonalize a two to the n by two to the n matrix, you only have to diagonalize a two times n by two times n matrix, which is by any measure that you'd like to come up with significantly better. Um, and so the question that you might want to ask is when is a Hamiltonian free in the sense that when does a Hamiltonian have uh, admit a solution via mapping to free fermions. And so that's that's the question that we wanted to ask in this bit of work. Um, and so I'll give you some background, uh, explain what I mean by that a little bit with you know some some equations and pictures and then give you the criteria and then then somebody else can talk about something else. Um, so, so, uh, so yes, what does it mean uh, there's this free fermion spin duality, and what do I mean by that? Well, generally, when we think of um, spin Hamiltonians, we think of Hamiltonians that look like this, where we have some real coupling coefficient b or bj and some Pauli string sigma j, and uh, sigma j is some in in some set v, which I've carefully chosen the letter v because that's going to come up later when we come to graphs and vertices. Um, <coughs> Uh, and one of the magical properties about Pauli strings is that they either commute or anti-commute depending on the overlap relationships between the x's and z's and y's in the Pauli string. Uh, and so we have this, this relationship here. Um, well, this is, this is the group commutator, in, just in case uh, people haven't seen that. On the other hand, when we think of fermions, we think of Hamiltonians that look like this, where we have, again, some real coupling coefficient, and then uh, strings are products of uh, fermionic operators, where here I've... Um, sort of abused notation and used firm, uh, Majorana fermions instead of, instead of complex fermions, but it still works. And so then we get a picture that looks like this. And I know that this is not physically accurate, so don't get cross with me for that. But we think about them hopping around a lattice, bumping into each other, and just as they move, some of them affect the movement of others. Uh, but there's also a really nice sort of commutation relation that is analogous to this Pauli operation here which is uh, this canonical anti-commutation relations of Majorana fermions. And so because of this and because of the fact that you can only ever have one fermion at once, then the Hilbert space dimension of a, of a fermionic model and a spin model is the same. And so there's a, a duality between the two, and we can map between the two. And the, one, the mapping that we know and love is the jordan Vigno mapping. Um, and this is generally what we think of when we do, when we map from fermions to spins and spins to fermions, is we apply the jordan Wigner transformation and then try and uh, look for symmetries and whatnot to, to reduce the order of the fermionic strings and hope that we can get something nice. Uh, but the crucial thing about the jordan Wigner and for a long time what people thought was, was possible is that these, uh, these mappings are generator to generator in the sense that uh, each one of these Pauli strings is mapped to a product of Pauli's. Um, 
So you might be wondering why would you bother mapping from spins to fermions? Um, uh, if, if you have a fermionic system and you have a quantum that you want to you, you want to simulate and you have a quantum computer, then it makes a lot of sense to say, oh, can I can I map to spins and then use my quantum computer to simulate it? But why would you go the other way? Because then I just have another fermionic Hamiltonian that I can't solve anyway. But it turns out that if uh, if in the magical case that when you do this mapping, your your fermionic Hamiltonian is bilinear in the sense that it, it only has quadratic terms. Uh, then this is a free fermionic system. And so individually, the fermions don't interact with one another, um, and you can consider them individually moving around the lattice. They don't have to, you don't have to worry about them, you, you just solve them directly. Uh, and one of the telltale signs of this is that you can rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of ladder operators here, where you have, um, within each symmetry sector J, you have uh, a set of single particle energy is epsilon, and then a commutator of these ladder operators, and then the basically these, this commutator of the ladder operators effectively is a, equivalent to a Pauli Z. So it's you can see that the that within each symmetry sector, the energy um, eigenvalues are just a sum of uh, single particle energies with minus one or plus one there. Uh, um, and one of the sort of telltale signs of this is that if you have a Hamiltonian of this form within each symmetry sector, you can, these ladder operators commute with the Hamiltonian um, to the, the commutation, the commutator of the ladder operator with the Hamiltonian is proportional to the ladder operator uh, with the constant pro proportionality being negative two times these single particle energies. So if you want to tell whether or not your free fermionic model is whether or not your, uh, your model is free fermionic, you just need to construct a ladder operator of this form and show that it has this commutation structure here, uh, commutation relation here, and then, then you're done. You can then just read off the energies and greatly reduce the, the system. Um, so like I said, generally we think of uh, mapping between fermions and spins as being this generator to generator mapping, but it, it turns out that not all free fermionic mappings are generator to generator. Um, Paul Fenley, in this paper called the Four Fermions, well, Free Fermions Behind the Disguise, pre uh, presented this model called the Four Fermion model, which looks like this. It's a, a one dimensional lattice, and the, with Pauli strings being um, x, z, z on, on the set of three neighbors as you go along. And uh, it turns out that, there's, that if you were to map this to a, a fermionic system using Jordan Wigner or any generator to generator mapping, you get a quartic Hamiltonian. Uh, and so this is, it, it looks highly non free fermion. But it turns out that regardless of that, it has a free fermionic spectrum. So you want to know, well, I wanted to know, you know, what's going on? Why is that possible? Um, and this is that paper. And uh, okay. And so at this point, I can now tell you why, well, what I'm going to tell you are the results, and then, and then I'll go through some, explain these results in a little bit. So it, I said that it's provably uh, not free, uh, it, that I said that there was no generator to generator mapping that would produce a, a, bilinear, uh, a bilinear fermionic Hamiltonian for the four fermion Hamiltonian, and the reason for that is because it's provable to show that if you want to have a generator to generator or generalized Jordan Wigner mapping from spins to fermions, then something called the frustration graph, which I'll define shortly, uh, has to be a line graph. Um, and, there, and this was shown by Adrian Chapman and Steve Flamia in, in recently, that's cut off, it's 2019 or something. But, um, and then after that, we showed that a, a mapping of the, in one dimension of the type that, Jordan, uh, that Paul Fenley speaks about it's possible if and only if the frustration graph has a, 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 is claw and even hole free. Um, and the thing that these two classes of graphs have in common is that they both have no claws. Uh, and it would be really nice if we could just say, that's it, no claws, you're done. If you have no claws, then it's a free fermion. But unfortunately, yeah, that's, that's not enough. You also need something called a simplicial click. And so a graph that has a simplicial click and is claw free is called simplicial claw free. And a simplicial click is one of these orange guys here, but I'll define that a bit more rigorously later. But this is this is what you need to. This is the results of this talk: is that um, previously it was known that you could perform Jordan Wigner if you had a line graph, frustration graph. Then we showed that there's an even whole claw free frustration graph, and now we've unified those two uh, by finding the simplicial claw free graphs. 
are also free fermions. Um, so why a graph theory? Why do we want to do this via graph theory? Well, the reason is because of this magical relation that Pallies have, that they either commute or anti-commute and nothing else. And, and as a result, you can say, OK, well, if they commute, don't put a line. And if they do commute, then do put a line. And that's exactly what we do. So the frustration graph that I've been mentioning is this graph where we for each Hamiltonian term, each Pauli Hamiltonian term, you get a vertex, something like this. And then uh, the edge set is defined by two vertices are connected if they're corresponding Pauli's anti-commute. And so you might get something like this. And so, um, yeah. Uh, and so the first thing you might ask is, how can the frustration structure de uh, completely determine the spectrum of the, of the Hamiltonian? Well, as it turns out, you actually know an example where this is true, which is the single qubit Hamiltonian, which looks like this. And if I was to square, well, if I was to write the frustration graph, you see that each of these terms anti-commute. So we have this click, uh, or this, uh, this, this triangle, which is a complete graph on three vertices. And so if I square the Hamiltonian, um, I get something like this. But then you see all the cross terms cancel. Uh, and so it, it's just proportional to the identity. And so then I can easily read off the, the energy eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian as just plus or minus square root of a squared plus b squared plus c squared. Um, but what if I then take another Hamiltonian that is not quite as simple as a single qubit Hamiltonian, but has this form, but is uh, a complete graph. For example, this one here is a complete graph on six vertices. Well, again, I can do the same thing. I can square the Hamiltonian. All the cross terms will cancel. And the, the energy spectrum is, is just, you can just read it off as plus or minus the sum of the squares of the coefficients. And the story doesn't really change. It just gets a little bit more complicated. And so as it turns out, you can, in fact, from the frustration graph, determine a whole load of facts about the spectrum, particularly if it has some nice properties. Uh, and so I now have to do a little bit of graph theory. And so at this point, you can go to sleep for a little while. And then at the end, wake up Camille. Um, so the first, set, the first graph theoretic uh, term that I'm going to introduce is this independent set, which is a subset of vertices in the graph that are not connected. The opposite of that is a click, which is a subset of vertices within the graph that are completely connected. Another one that's important for us that will become important shortly is something called an even hole, which is a subset of vertices in the graph that is even and that forms a cycle, but that has no, no chords across the cycle. So the, the order or the, the degree of every vertex is two. That means the number of edges coming in or out of any vertex is, is exactly two. Uh, and the last one is the claw, which I've drawn before and is so named because it looks like this. Um, OK. Uh, and then using these independent sets, we define something called an independence polynomial, uh, which is basically the sum of the product of the coefficients for each vertex multiplied by x to the power of the size of that set. But it's much more you know, intuitive to look at an example. If we look at this graph here, the independence polynomial is, is this, where the, obviously the, the zeroth order independent set is empty. There's no vertices in it, and so it's just one. And then the, um, the first order independent sets are just the sum of all the terms, so a squared plus b squared plus et cetera. And then the second order terms are the, the independent sets of size two, so a squared c squared plus a squared f squared plus et cetera times x squared. And this is the independence polynomial. And then the last graph theoretic thing that I have to do, which um, is horrible, is, the, uh, is this thing called the simplicial click. Um, so a simplicial click is a click in a graph. It's a subset of the graph that is completely connected, such that for every vertex in the click, the neighborhood of that vertex, take away the original click, is also a click. And um, that's horrible. <laughs> and it took me about, you know, a week to get my head around it. So uh, I'm going to say it again. <laughs> a simplicial click is a fully connected subgraph, K, in the graph, such that for all vertices in the click, the neighborhood of that vertex, uh, take away the original click, is also a click. So if, does this thing work? OK, so if we look at this example here, um, this orange guy is a simplicial click. And if we look at this vertex here, the neighborhood of this vertex on this side is 
these two plus this orange click. So if I take away the original click, it's just these two blue vertices, and these blue vertices it forms a click. So this is a simpler to click. Um, OK, so the results are that a Hamiltonian whose frustration graph is claw-free and contains a simplicial click, you only need one, but um, often you have more, uh, admits a free fermion solution of this form, um, where you have some symmetry sectors, and then within each symmetry sector you get this, this thing, uh, where the single particle energy is epsilon uh, k within each symmetry sector is the roots of some polynomial, uh, where this polynomial um, is defined per symmetry sector, and these symmetry sectors have something to do with uh, these even holes. This is the products of terms within each even hole. So, um, yeah. So, examples. Um, here is a horrible Hamiltonian that you would probably never want to solve, but you can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> its frustration graph looks like this, um, and it contains no claws. It contains many simplicial clicks, and uh, it turns out that the solution is is very simple. Um, uh, but seriously, there are some more interesting things that you might want to do. So, at the very beginning of this talk, or not the very beginning, but fairly early on in this talk, I spoke about Paul Fenley's four fermion model, and so you might be interested in other higher order term, like fermionic models that have quartic terms or uh, that may initially look not free, but it turns out if you were to use a mapping like this, map it from fermions to spins and then back to fermions, you might, it might turn out that they're actually free. I mean, we, we have an example. I, I don't have many more, but they might exist. Um, so there are some open questions. For example, uh, how ubiquitous are free fermions? Like, this is a pretty extensive class of graphs, but how big is this class of graphs in terms of all the other graphs? If I just take a random graph, is it free or not? What are the chances based on some restrictions on the graphs? Um, can we go the other way? Uh, is there some way of leveraging this to, for, to find a fermion to qubit mapping? Um, I said that we can recognize when it's free fermion. I said that in some cases, I, mean, I gave you an example where it turned out it was easy, but um, recognizing it is is not necessarily the same as, as solving it exactly. Sometimes within each symmetry sector, there's just the, the magnitude of it is so large that it becomes difficult. Um, when we think of uh, can we, when we think of free fermion mappings via Jordan Wigner, there's this relationship between match gates, and so I wonder whether or not there's some set of gates that might be generalized versions of match gates that that get you to these fermionic Hamiltonians, um, and can we look at uh, impurity models and recognizing Gaussian ranks using a similar graph theoretic construction. Uh, oh, and the final thing is that I said uh, that if a Hamiltonian is um, simplicial and claw free, then the model is free fermion. And this is a one way inference. And so the question is is there, can we go the other way? And is there another condition that I need to add to go the other way? Uh, and that's everything. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for a very nice talk. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I guess you can hear me. Um, can you uh, reiterate what you meant by generator to generator and whether there were generator to generator mappings and which? I didn't understand that. Maybe. Yeah, OK. Um, <clears throat> Okay, uh, I think that was on the slide before this one. Right, so when I say generator to generator, what I mean is that each term in this, um, in this sum yes. goes directly to a term in this sum. I see, and you said there was an instance of a non-generator to generator correspondence? Yeah, uh, so this, correspondence. so anything that, um, sorry, so th this, this uh, Hamiltonian here is an instance of a, if you, if you map this via Jordan Wigner or any attempt to map each Pali string to an individual product of fermionic strings, uh, it won't work. The fermionic strings will be quartic at least. And so what's the correspondence in this case? Sorry? What's the correspondence in this case? By, what do you mean by correspondence, sorry? What's, what's, the, what's the mapping in this case? 
Oh, so it's, the mapping is is this. Um, it gets quite technical, and it's <laughs> it's um it's yeah. There's a it's really nonlinear. You basically have to. Um, I mean, I can I can explain it to you. It's really <laughs> it gets really hairy. <laughs> it's, Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, can you give some intuition for why you need claw free and this uh, simplicial clique? Yeah, so um, so when it comes to claw free, uh, basically, anytime you have a claw, you have to make a choice. Um, if you're hopping around a lattice, for example, and you come to a claw, you have to make a choice between turning left or right. and if it wasn't a claw, then necessarily you would be able to get back to the other vertex um, without missing out on that vertex. Uh, but if you don't have, if it, if it is a claw, then there's no guarantee that you'll be able to get back there without having to retrace your steps. Uh, that's the that's the claw-free one. Um, because with the claw free, you don't mean it's a minor, right? You mean like literally, there's like a vertex with like three neighbors which are not connected themselves. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, an induced, and it, there's no clause as an induced subgraph, is what I mean. Um, uh, but the the simplicial click one is a little bit more complicated. But effectively, you can think of it as um, when we think of Jordan Wigner, we think of like starting at defining an endpoint, and then drawing strings and wrapping them around, and then being you know. Um, but uh, the simplicial click effectively serves as an endpoint. It serves as a, a, a starting point for you to, to sort of grow these strings that um, turn out to be highly nonlinear and non-local. Great, thanks. Uh, so are there any examples of models uh, which have free fabian solutions which are not covered by your results? Is yeah, so um, when when I talk about free fabian models, uh, let's go back to this spin thing. Oh, it's here. That's right. When I talk about uh, free fabian models in the, of this form, I, I'm talking about fermionic models that are free for all um, for all values of, of BJ. Um, they're generic in the sense that they remain free even if I perturb the hell out of these BJs, then they remain free. Uh, there are examples where if I finally tune these, these coupling coefficients, I can find a free fermionic solution. Um, but once you, once you are not within that sort of very narrow parameter set, it's no longer free. Um, and they're not captured by, by this framework. OK. Let's thank Sam again for a very nice talk and thank you. answering all the questions. <laughs>